When we talk about synergies, we are talking about the functional grouping of elements of a system that need to adjust to each other to perform as a whole. Usually they adjust to each other, aiming to achieve a common goal. But for that happen, something must be left uncontrolled. And this is one of the main concepts that I will try to address during this video. In the, in the literature, you may find that uh, in Greek synergy wor means work together, which requires two important issues. One, the need of more than one element. And second, and the most important, when we have two elements in a system, and when we talk about synergies, these elements, two, three or more, should work to achieve a common goal. In the 19th century, this term was mainly associated to pathological movements. It had a pathological connotation. It was Nikolai Bernstein in, in the late 60s that bring this concept of synergies to the human movement science when it, it tried to respond to answer to the degrees of freedom problem. Now, to have an idea of the growing interest and the, 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 the importance of, of this concept of synergy in movement science, if you do a Google search and cross the term synergy and movement, for, you will find out close to 1,000 references in PubMed and over 120,000 references in, in Google Scholar. So you can also find in the literature three types of synergies. The first one is this one that you are watching in this video, the type A synergy usually associated to patients with neurological diseases. As you can see, it means that the muscles work together, but then cannot do a fluid movement. This movement of close the hands, this, if we do it, we close the, our fingers will adjust to each other to perform a fluid movement. That it does not happen on this kind of uh, movement here. Then you also have the type B synergies. The type B synergies, mostly used in the research in kine kinesiology, and the, the research is trying to find out how a set of elements, usually muscles, work together to perform some kind of movement, as this one in the, in, in the video, like the seat to stand movement. And then we have the type C. The type C it is the, the, the kind of synergies that we will address in sports performance. It is well supported by the principle of abundancy that states that all the degrees of free freedom in some way all participate in all tasks. But before moving on, I would like to make just, just a small um, announcement regarding uh, the, the degrees of freedom, because in the literature, they, they can be, um, you can find out two different definitions. The first one is this one. Degrees of freedom can be analyzed as the quantity of elements involved and to be controlled to produce a coordinated movement. For instance, the quantity of muscles involved to, ex to, to do a flexion and an extension of my arm. But also, you may find out the several possibilities of action of each of those elements. For instance, my shoulder have a considerable amount of possibilities, sorry, possibilities of action, whereas my elbow has less possibilities of action when compared to my shoulder. So these two kinds of analysis you will find out in the literature. Here we will focus more on this one. The degrees of freedom as possibilities of action of the, the elements involved. So now let's go back to the type C synergies and analyzing this beautiful movement, this punch from Conor McGregor. I think that you will agree that this movement happens in a space. Okay. That performance has a goal, which is where to punch the face of the opponent. And we did that space. We have Conor have some elements that contribute to the performance. For instance, it has the shoulder, joint angle, also his elbow, joint angle, and also his wrist, joint angle. All these elements need to adjust to each other in order to stabilize the right point where to punch the opponent in the face. So we have here two concepts that seems to be complementary. For one side, we have the variability of several elements to stabilize the performance goal, which is the place where to punch. 
So the arm joints create probably a synergy where the elements adjust to stabilize that the, the performance towards the goal. Well, a general working hypothesis of, of this uh, idea of synergies is the movement variability, which is a, a feature of all, the, of all the biological perception and action systems. But why variability is so important? Well, because movement variability arises from the need that we have to adapt, adapt to the task and environment, environmental constraints. Let's see the dribbling action, for instance. There is several arm degrees of freedom that will adjust to each other to adapt to what? To the ball velocity upwards. When we do a dribbling action, we need to control the height of the ball. To do this, to stabilize the height of the ball, our shoulder and our elbow, elbow need to adjust to each other in order to stabilize this movement. So, probably we can get synergies by the adjustment of the shoulder reciprocal adjust to the elbow movement to stabilize the height of the drilling task. So these adjustments require reliability, which lead that the harm work as a wall. So we have two complementary concepts here. For one side, we have stability, stability of the performance goal. On the other side, we have variability of the task relevant elements. But now one question, what happens when the components of the system are not physically connected? As it happens, for instance, in team sports. So the studies in, in, in interpersonal coordination starts in the late 60s. With the, the, the first work that we have uh, records is from William S. Condon, who analyzed the movements of uh, patients with schizophrenia. However, Condon, Condon work have some kind of uh, methodological issues. And from the late 60s until the late 80s, this kind of research on interpersonal coordination was stopped. It's only with Frank Bernieri that solved the met this kind of methodological issues and created time series analysis that the interpersonal coordination starts restarts to uh, growing as a research area. But the boost of, of this research area was with the, the hypothesis that was raised by Derry Newton when he set the theoretical background for studies such as the PhD uh, study of Richard Schmidt. Newton's hypothesis was that uh, people are visually coupled when they need to perform coordinate with the other. So, so Richard Schmidt confirmed this and further studies uh, after the, the, the Richard's uh, PhD also confirmed that we have intent, if we have intention or not, we will coordinate with the others as long as we are visually coupled. So visual perception is uh, uh, the medium that allows us to coordinate with the others. But one question that emerged more specific to interpersonal synergies is this one. Why should we study interpersonal syn synergies? Well, because honestly, we do not know how people socially coordinate to each other. But we know that visual coupling is important. We know the states that characterize interpersonal coordination. There is a considerable amount of research that can characterize based on the relative phase analysis in-phase in and out-phase synchronization states. But now, how are synergies formed? That is one main question that we are struggling to, to, to achieve. What are the degrees of freedom, the possibilities of action involved on those synergies formation? And what are the implications for sports performance? Are synergies good or are synergies bad? We do not know. And then, where is the control? When two or more players, two or more subjects need to perform some kind of task, when they need to coordinate to the others, where is the control? So if we do a laboratory task, as this, this task here with two participants, they need to walk through this corridor, eight meters corridor, and the performance goal is to maintain the relative position. Well, the relative position can be captured by the interpersonal angle. So what we have here, we have a performance variable, a performance goal, which is maintain the interpersonal angle from the beginning of the task until the end of the task. And we have task relevant elements. To maintain that angle, 
both subjects need to adjust the velocity of the, of the walking. And by this adjustment, they will stabilize the angle. If this happens, the control is on the interpersonal angle and we have, they form a synergy. So if we plot, after we collect the data, the positional data of the players, if we plot the walking subject's velocity, we can see here more or less the adjustments of the subject one regarding the subject two, and they need to adjust to each other to stabilize the performance variable, the angle between them. So again, where is the control? A few years ago, in the late 90s, there is a beautiful paper from Schoner and Scholz where they, will, they, they, they present this, this idea of the uncontrolled manifold. I will try to explain briefly in this, this, this manifold and this uncontrolled manifold. So if we plot the velocity of subject 1 with the velocity of subject 2 on time, what we see here is a cloud of dots. Okay. These dots, in a certain way, represent how the player 1 adjusts his velocity to, to player 2, to subject 2, and the opposite is also true. And then we have this black line here, which represents the task manifold. Also, we can compute the variability around in, in the proximity of this task manifold. Okay? But before moving on, this cloud of points creates uh, subspace. And this subspace is the UCM, the uncontrolled manifold. So why it is uncontrolled? We have uh, two kinds of variability here. One, one variability that put these dots further away from the task manifold. It is the variability on this axis, which means that one subject increases the velocity, the other one it is desirable that increases in up in a certain way in order that the, the dot will be close to the task manifold. If this then does not happen, this kind of variancy will not contribute to stabilize the performance goal, which is the angle between them. So, one thing, we have a performance goal and they need to control this kind of variancy in order to stabilize the interpersonal angle but we have a different variability, which is the variance along the task manifold. This variance here can be left and should be left free. It means that all the possible solutions are possible as long as they will contribute to stabilize the interpersonal angle. So the UCM is based on this. It's based on this subspace. In this subspace, we can compute this variance. We can alter can compute this variance here and the output is quite simple to understand. It's, it is a ratio. If the variance, the good variance, the compensated variance will be higher than the bad variance, the uncompensated variance, the UCM will be above one. And as Latash said in, in a paper 2010, if we have an UCM above one, we have a synergy. And an UCM below one, which, mean, which means that we don't have a synergy. So, synergies are functional groupings between elements of a system, are sensitive to contextual changes, that's why they are temporary, and because of these sensitive to contextual changes, which becomes temporary, we can call it, and we will find out in the literature, they are called that soft assembly synergies, which will remain which while remain, they will constrain the, 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 the elements of the system behave like a wall. Two properties of, uh, of synergies. One, it must happen a reciprocal compensation between the, the, the elements of the system. And second, there is a compression of the degrees of freedom. So when the first property occurs, means that there is a reduction of the degrees of freedom instead of trying to explain the behavior of one element and the other we explain the behavior of both the collective behavior or the dyadic behavior of both subjects both players there are three layers on a synergy the base layer which are the individual components subjects players whatsoever then in the Upper in the upper layer, the highest layer, we have task and envir environmental constraints such as field dimensions, 
rules of the game, number of, uh, of opponent players, and it is in the middle of these two layers that adaptive behavior will emerge and this is where synergies will be formed. There is a very good example that I always like to bring to, to my classes. It's uh, to, to, to illustrate how potentially, hypothetically, synergies can be formed in team sports. This image is from Chelsea a few years ago, highlight the need of cooperation between the first defensive line and the second defense, the players on the, the first defensive line and the players on the second defensive line. We can see that the players in blue adjust to each other to maintain an hypothetical line with the players in the first in the first line. This kind of adjustments to keep the interpersonal distance between them and between dimes and, and between lines within a certain value may be the basis for interpersonal synergies among these players. Thank you for watching this video.